right. Second Corinthians chapter 5. Let's just have a quick run. We've been looking at the term in Christ for the preacher. Second Corinthians chapter 5 uh, and verse 14. For the love of Christ constrains us because we thus judge that if one died for all, then we are all dead. We are all dead, pardon me. 15, and that he died for all, that they which live should not live henceforth, should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again. Verse 16, wherefore henceforth know we no man after the flesh. Though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, a new creature, all things are passed away, behold, all things are become new, and all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ and had given to us the ministry of reconciliation. To wit, verse 19, that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and had given to us or had committed unto us the message, that's the word logos, the message of reconciliation. Now, this morning, we were looking at Christ as ministry. Uh, I, I, I'm not dealing with the content yet, but Christ as ministry. You know, we, sometimes we learn Christ as the message, and we, we might lose Christ the minister, Christ the ministry. Because you will have a whole lot of challenge if you have the ministry, uh, sorry, the message of Christ, and you don't have the ministry of Christ. And then Paul starts out by saying, we have known Christ after the flesh. And we dealt a bit uh, with that. Because you need to realize that Christ also came as a minister. He, he came as a sacrifice for sins, Hebrews 9, 27, 26, to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Uh, he, he, by his death... You know, uh, Romans 4.25, he was delivered up for our offenses, raised up for our justification. Yes, that's true. He, he was sacrificed for sin. First John 2.2 2 is a proposition for our sins, not only us, but the whole world. But Jesus was also a minister. So you, you can have Christ the sacrifice for sins, and you don't yet understand Christ the minister for the sacrifice of sins. So Philippians 2 brings to our minds that personality of Christ, the minister. Philippians 2 and 5. Let this man be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. So he says, he became a servant. First uh, Peter 2 and verse 21. For thereunto were you called, even, because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us what? An example, that you should follow his steps. Who did no sin, neither was God found in his mouth. Then it says, who then, when he was reviled, reviled not again. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself or committed to him that judges righteously. Uh, Hebrews chapter 8 verse 6 lets us know that Christ was a minister. Hebrews chapter 8 verse 6. Hebrews 8 6. But hath, now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry. Hebrews 8 6. Hebrews 8 2. A minister of the true Tabernacle of the sanctuary of the true tabernacle with the Lord preached and not man. So we identify Christ as a minister. Uh, you know, in Matthew 20, verse 28, he says, He didn't come to be ministered to, but to minister and to, be a ra to give himself as a ransom for many. So in Christ is the sacrifice for sins, also in Christ is the example for ministry. So Jesus is also a minister. And pay very good attention to that. You discover that something Paul brought out in that definition in Philippians 2.5 is that he put aside his privileges. He became what he was not for the sake of others. And, and that's important. 
that he laid aside his privileges. Now, you discover that Paul used another word. Of course, the word minister is, it, it means to serve, to, to be a waiter. Then Paul used another word, uh, that's the word slave. Slave. So I'm a slave of Christ. Paul says that often. James 1.1, 1, 1, James, uh, James the servant. That word there means a bond servant. So some guy says James Bond, servant of our Lord Jesus Christ, you know. <laughs> You know, <laughs> it's a bond servant. Now, a bond servant is one who lays aside his privileges or he chooses to serve another. You know, it's his will to pay back a debt or to he, he chooses to hold you. Then he serves to pay back the debt. Now, the, the minister of the gospel is called a bond servant. Now, that's when you choose to be. That is, I see myself as paying back an obligation. The moment you don't see what you're doing as an obligation you choose to fulfill, you may end up running an organization and not a ministry. So he, Paul saw himself and just every other apostle as paying back an obligation. Now Jesus did the same thing. He didn't have to do it. I'm going to say that again. That's why it's called obedience. Jesus was not programmed to die. He obeyed to die. It wasn't like he came to the earth and mm. then he went to the cross. No. He obeyed. It's called obedience. If he was programmed to obey, it wouldn't be called humility. So in other words, it was a choice. Just like martyrdom, when you die for the sake of the gospel, it's a choice. So Jesus was a servant and in being a servant, he lays the example down for us for ministry. In, now, what kind of servant is this? Philippians chapter 4, or Colossians chapter 4, pardon me. See an example that Paul uses for a man called Epaphras. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 12. Paul says, Epaphras, who is one of you, a servant of Christ, salutes you. Always laboring fervently for you in prayers that you may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God. Now, Epaphras is an example of a minister, right? Now, just notice something in verse 17, Paul now talks to an Archippus in the congregation take heed to the ministry that you have received in the Lord that thou fulfill it. He had given you an example of a true minister in 12. Then he says, say to Archippus, you've seen Epaphras, he labors, he's a minister, he's a servant, he's someone who doesn't act like an overlord in the work of the ministry. He, he, he says that about him. And he says, he's a minister for you. In other words, you are a servant for men, not for things. You're a servant for men, not for things. And a servant serves out of love. That's why he says the love of Christ constrains us. God, I said it yesterday night, God's giving of Christ is to demonstrate his love. He didn't start loving when he gave Christ. He only demonstrated it when he gave Christ. Romans 5 8. God demonstrated his love towards us while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. And the writers of the Bible, the apostles, picked the word agape a lot. Agape means to prefer someone to yourself. Agape means to sacrifice. It means to give up your rights and privileges. And it can go both ways. It can go for carnal things too. When you hear the love of many wax cold, the word there is agape. When you hear, love not the world, nor the things that are in this world, 1 John 2, 15, I believe, that's agape. That means you give up for something. So agape is not the love of God. It only describes the love of God. You give up. That is, when you give up your love for God for things, it's called agape. That means you, you prefer something above the other. Now, in the agape of God, he prefers man. In other words, he lays aside his own privileges for man. So a minister of the gospel must be that motivated. You are not serving yourself. 
You are that new man in Christ, don't forget. And you have the capacity to be just like Jesus in service. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. The first thing Paul says is you are a new man. Say, I'm a new man. And the Christ life produces a selfless life. Christ comes into our hearts not for us to have a new way of pursuing our desires. No. The Christ life plants in you a selfless life. Because Christ in his death, in his incarnation, in his death, shows us someone who is not selfish. And so for us as preachers of the gospel, we must realize Christ the ministry. Christ the minister. You see, quit always liking the gospel of grace because it sounds like goody goody. You don't have to, you don't have to, you don't have to. Well, brother, there are things you have to do. There are things you've got to do. you got to walk in love. you got to give up privileges. So quit liking things for goody-goody. So a lot of guys, you know, they selectively read the scriptures. We saw this morning, remember Philippians 1.29. You are not just called to believe on his name, but also to do what? Suffer for his sake. And that's part of it. So he says, we learn that from Christ. Let's quickly look at something, 2 Corinthians. Hope you're following me tonight. 2 Corinthians chapter 3. We track the word new man, uh, and, 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 and I'll leave the content for tomorrow. Uh, 2 Corinthians 3.3. 3. Okay, here is Paul. He says, look, we are the epistle of Christ. See, I'm an epistle of Christ. So he says, we are written by the spirit of the living God, and that means you are born of the spirit. Not on the tables of stone, but on the fleshly tables of the heart. That's the first thing he says, the spirit of the living God. Then he says, our sufficiency is not of ourselves, in verse 5, but it's of God. In other words, what happens in this covenant is a supply, not a demand. Then in verse 6, he says, who also has made us. Now watch that. We are sufficient of God, by God. Then he has now made us able ministers of the New Testament. Now don't get too excited without knowing the word minister. The word minister is a servant. Able minister, able servant, able waiter, able errand man. You went quiet. Of the new covenant, New Testament. Some guy was saying there's a difference between covenant and testament. Some guys just say nonsense. What's the difference? Say, spirit of Christ is different from spirit of God. Tell me something. <laughs> so I say, we are the church. Every believer is the church. Seriously? So who are your members? <laughs> you are not the church. The church is a gathering. And you cannot be a gathering. Except you are legion. <laughs> and then he says, the letter kill it, the spirit gives life. Verse 7. Then he mentions the ministry of death. We'll leave, we'll leave that. Then he mentions the ministration of the spirit in verse 8. Then he mentions in verse 9 the ministration of righteousness. So if in chapter 5 and verse 17, again, it says the spirit of the Lord, then he calls liberty. So in chapter 5, when you read all things are passed away, he mentions condemnation is gone. He mentions death is gone. Uh, then he says, the spirit has come. So in the spirit, you have righteousness, praise God. You have the glory of God. You have liberty. In chapter 4, verse 2, he says, we have renounced. Now look at four, chapter 4, verse 1. So it makes sense now. You know, we said, we are able ministers of the new covenant. Before you go, woo, I'm an able minister of the new covenant. Look at what we're able to do. Chapter 4, verse 1. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, we have received mercy and we faint not. Say, I faint not. That means we don't give up and we don't compromise. Verse 2. 
We have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. So if you take 3 6, you must look at 4 2. Not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. This is servanthood. If our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them that believe not. Let the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, shall shine unto them. Can we take verse 5 together? Together, Let's go. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves what? So if you are an able minister of the new covenant, you don't preach yourself. You are a servant. So before you like the content, are you the right container? Because if you put the right content in a wrong container, it all comes out bad. The container of the ministry of Christ has to be a Christ, oh sorry, the message of Christ has to be a Christ ministry. We are servants. We have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty. Not handling the word of God deceitfully. Hallelujah. Say, well, tithing. I don't have a problem with tithing. As long as it's your money, you give it the way you want. So if there's anybody that says if you tithe, you are doing the wrong thing. The person has something wrong in how he thinks. It's your giving. You choose how to give. If you want to support your pastor, taking 10% of your money, that's your choice. And God honors it. That's true. Anybody who preaches against that has a problem. And I, and, I, and I have a problem with people fighting, tithing all over the body of Christ. How many people even give tithes? That's not the, that is not the antichrist. So, just give. Because you can you can emphasize New Testament giving so well that all you are saying is we shouldn't give. Sometimes when you see scriptures handled by uh, incompetent people, and because you found out that tithing is Old Testament, you're right. And then you want to drive out that a lot from people and say, look, it's not New Testament. Jesus is not preaching. The apostles is not preaching. At the end of the day, you leave people with that lack of responsibility to give. Yet the entire epistles, not one single epistle is without an instruction to give. They taught giving as strong as they taught prayer. You cannot be a person of the word if you need a sermon to give. Oh, you went quiet? Is there a problem? It shouldn't be. Praise the Lord. We'll get to that shortly. <laughs> So the able minister of the new covenant is enabled by God to serve. He serves. He gives up his rights and privileges just like Jesus. You get the container right as well. As you are getting the content right and you are, so wow, I used to think this was what the scripture meant. And no, no, you also must look at the container. Because Paul in the same breath, 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 3 says, can we take it together? Giving no offense. 2 Corinthians 6, 3. Giving no offense in anything. Which ministry now? The ministry of the New Testament. That the ministry be not blamed. But in all things, approving ourselves as what? Ministers of God in much patience. Those are verses you skip. Affliction shall not arise a second time. Necessities. Distresses. Some guys can't even cope when they have stripes, imprisonment, Thomas, labors, watches, fastings, pureness, knowledge. I want to skip all that one. It looks good. Let me go to eight. Honor and dishonor. Evil report and good report. Deceive us and yet we are true. As unknown yet well known as dying behold we live, chasing yet killed. Wow! In 
the new covenant ministry? Exactly, buddy. Yeah. Our example of ministry, we stood and bore the contradiction of sinners. He was insulted. The same people he blessed walked out on him. He didn't handle, he didn't hand over a single curse. He never valued his ministry by crowd followership. Jesus kept saying his will is to do the will of he that sent him. And that was important. So an able minister of the new covenant is a servant. And I must say this, you know, it's important to say this. That many of us sometimes, and myself inclusive, sometimes we, 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 do, we handle the work of the ministry like a personal estate. Forgetting that we are errant men and women. That's all you are. You will go back and give account to the real master. Sorry, that's not you. The real master is the one who died for sins. The real master is the Lord Jesus Christ. You are privileged to serve. Someone said, without me, I can imagine what God would have done. Said that on national television. Less than six months, he went out of circulation. And God has been fine since then. To say you are indispensable is foolishness gone to seed. You are not indispensable. <laughs> you can't be. <laughs> so you must approve yourself. Prove. How do I approve myself? Paul lists it for you. Contradictions. In season. Out of season. Watch this now. In 2 Corinthians chapter 2, before he got to chapter 3, there was a discussion. Now pay attention here now. In verse 12, I'm going to bust some bubbles here. He says, furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, of course, verse 14 has been used for other things. So, thanks be unto God, who causes us to triumph. So, hey, triumph now. Hooray! you got to reign. If you're a businessman, reign. If you're a footballer, particularly in Arsenal, reign. Amen. What about that? <laughs> If you don't like it, too bad. You know, God doesn't want devils. He said, cast out devils. So if you're a red devil, we'll cast you out. <laughs> Let's leave that for now. And if you're a Chelsea fan, he says, do not be drunk with wine wearing the excess, but be filled with the spirit. But 2 Corinthians 2.14 <laughs> Now, thanks be unto God. You know, we can leave that scripture out of context and lose the meaning. What was he talking about? Now, the word he causes us to triumph is when you win a battle, you have victory. Then you now parade the, the evidence of your victory for people to see it. For example, when Arsenal won the FA Cup. What do you think I'm going to think about? I don't care about the League Shield, the FA Cup. And then we went through London parading the trophy. Now pay attention. What is he dealing with here? What does he mean by the parade of Christ's trophy? Before you link it to your personal ambition. Verse 12, 2 Corinthians 2. Furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel, a door was opened unto me of the Lord. I had no rest in my spirit because I found no titles, my brother. Verse 13. And taking my leave of them, I went from ends unto Macedonia. So what was he talking about? The preaching? The preaching? So verse 14. When I went unto Macedonia, verse 14 now says, Thanks be unto God. Who parades the victory in Christ by making manifest the savor of his knowledge by us in every place. Verse 14 is not for personal victory, it's for the preaching of the gospel. It's when you preach the gospel that it causes you to triumph. The preaching of the gospel is that triumphant train. Don't say, we are triumphing. No, 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 no. And the last time you did evangelism was 16 years ago. Boy, you are not triumphing. 
The triumphant train is to take the gospel around. And it says you make manifest the savor of his knowledge. Verse 15, we are unto God a sweet savor of Christ in them that are saved. Uh, and, and in them that perish to the one we are the savor of death to death, the one that doesn't believe. Then he says to the other, the savor of life to life, who is sufficient for these things. Now, if you read this verse very well, is this personal or about the preaching of the gospel? So, verse 17, and this is where you approve yourself. We are not as many which corrupt the word of God, but as of sincerity. Oh, this language is weak. Give us the Amplified Translation for the first time. Let me read this one. The Amplified Translation, come on. Is this it? For we are not as many like hostas. A hoxter is the one who sells for gain. He says we are not like many. Don't forget, they are also preaching the word. They are preaching the finished work. But the reason why they are preaching the finished work is that it's an access for more money. He says we are not like those people who are ox stars. This is from where he got to chapter 3 and says we are able ministers of the new covenant. So you must distinguish yourself. Many of uh, those who get in contact with the true gospel of Christ always fail the money test. If you are yet to pass the money test, can you separate your individual needs from the gospel you preach? Say, so we are not hucksters. We are not hucksters. There's a grace upon my life that if, you, if I lay hands on you, you get new contracts. That's a hockster. We don't need your money. But we are just asking you to give so that you can partake of our grace. Is it that they make us stupid? How can someone say, I don't need your money but give? And then you, you came out like, that's bewitching. If you don't need my money, there are others who need it and they ask for it. I'll give them. They don't need your money. The gospel does not need your money. Says who? No problem. But give them envelopes. We're only asking you to give so we can deliver you from poverty. <laughs> That's a smart oxter. <laughs> You're asking me to give you money so I can have money. Isn't that dumb? I give you so I can have. I think that is like making my school certificate stupid. If I believe that, then I ought to go back to my, all my schools, apologize for awarding me a wrong certificate. And go to my hometown and apologize for being a disgrace. That someone says, to have more money, give me your money. How, does that, how are we brainwashed? That's why the prosperity gospel made preachers rich, not the congregants. It's a successful way of bewitching people. And they will always feel they have not done enough. All right, you went quite good. We are not oxters. No, we aren't. Paul said that. So we don't preach this. So the next chapter, he now introduces spiritual realities. Liberty in Christ. No condemnation. That means the gospel isn't coming for your money. Keep it. Give cheerfully. He says that in chapter 8 and chapter 9. But the gospel isn't coming for your money. The gospel comes for your heart. Rich or poor, he loves you. That's the gospel. So in this we see God in Christ. If you gave many people John 1, 12 to write, they will say, for as many as received him, to them gave he power to take over. How about that kind of translation? To them gave he power to become the sons of God. <laughs> no, 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 as many as received him. Have you seen some folks who preach and say, well, uh, 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 14 ways to become something. You know, there was many ways. And then they say, if you want to enjoy these things, 
you have to first of all take the first step. The first step is surrendering to Christ. And then those who don't have money will come out. If I were the one, I would come out. I don't have money. You, to, you told me to have money. I should come out and surrender to Christ. I will surrender. And that's why we have a lot of fake converts. That's not the gospel. But you are taking advantage of people's vulnerability. Because they are vulnerable. And so, that's a hawkster. You don't do that. You do not exchange the gospel for material things. So you must get the container right. You can have the message and twist it. I've seen people talk beautifully up to that point. Everything looks cool. Everything looks lovely. Christ has done it. He has all our sins on Christ. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Then they get to this angle. Then the worst change. A fellow who had just told us about the Old Testament, how they didn't have the true riches, eventually finds Solomon as the mentor. In the same sermon. He said, you don't have two riches. He said, no, we are not under the law. No way. We don't do the law. Excited. By the time you get to the real issue, then he says, look at Solomon. Ah. After we have left the law, we now brought it back for the sake of our belly. Hope you are following this. In Philippians 1.27, Paul gives a stern warning. Let your conversation be as it becometh the gospel of Christ. Let it be consistent. Let your conduct be consistent. He says that. In 1 Corinthians 9, 1 Corinthians 9, I've seen people preach something like blood money. That Christ's blood was shed for money. What a shame. Because you are African? I thought you got that. <laughs> you know, Africans believe in blood money. I can't say it with my mouth. So just understand my gesticulation. <laughs> First Corinthians 9. See what Paul said here. In verse 16. Though I preach the gospel, I have nothing to glory. Say, I have nothing to glory. Good. Of, for necessity is laid upon me, yea, woe is unto me if I preach not the gospel. Now watch what he says. If I do this thing willingly, I have a reward. That is, I'm not doing it for gain. But if against my will, a dispensation of the gospel is committed unto me. What is my reward then? Verily, when I preach the gospel, I may make the gospel of Christ without charge. I hope you don't send out forms for people to fill and give them the range of your honorarium. Prepare my ministry. Were they pre-blessed? Not wrong in giving a private jet to a minister. Anybody who speaks against that is just jealous. People can give what they love to people that they appreciate. But the moment a preacher begins to make a charge, that's where the problem is. He says, I'm not making a charge here. I may make the gospel of Christ, verse 18, without charge, that I abuse not my power in the gospel. Whether you like it or not, people believe preachers. They, that's why they are called believers. <laughs> they believe you. And you can abuse the power that you have. In the same breath, as, they are, say, as they, are, they are thanking God that they are out of religion, you can say, yes, you are out. You are out. Now, to connect to this new covenant access. Uh -uh. And because they are excited, say, bring out that thing that is worthy of the redemption reality we have in Christ. Hey! Chai! You are a hawk star. We don't need your money. We don't need it. You need our grace. Hawk star. 
Then he says, watch this. Though I be free from all, yet have I made myself servant unto all. He's repeating it. That I might gain the more. Unto the Jews, I became as Jew. We can just run through all that for our time. Then he says in verse 24. Know ye not that they which run in a grace run all, but one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain. Verse 25. 1 Corinthians 9. And every man that strives for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. We, what? The moment your mind is off that incorruptible crown, then you will be a hawkster. He says, we do preach the gospel for rewards that cannot be calculated with money. Then he says, because our reward is incorruptible, I therefore so run, verse 26, not as a certainty, so fight I, not as one that beats the air. So I keep under my body. This has nothing to do with immorality. This is about preaching the gospel without filthy lucre. I keep my body under. I bring it into subjection. That is, I keep my appetite under. I keep my love for vacation in Europe under. Come on. I keep, I love vacation in Europe, all right? I keep, I love private jets. I've been in some, and boy, it's good. Anybody telling you it's evil, it's evil in himself. <laughs> but you see, I keep those desires under. It shouldn't come into my teaching. Lest after preaching unto others, I have no reward. It's not about losing salvation. It's about losing your reward for ministry because you want reward with men. So, you can have the content, but the container is corrupted. Check your reward system. Now, how would Paul write this? And this is the point. And then he writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy 5.17. Let the elders that rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in word and doctrine. He's saying in verse 18, he says, a laborer is worthy of his wages. Then I'm getting confused. You just told us now, Paul, that you don't preach this for reward. Yet you give an instruction that those who preach must be well taken care of. The point is, those who preach don't make the demand. That's the difference. Don't reject people honoring you materially, but don't make a request. Don't reject it. I don't reject good things. Why should I reject good things? Job said we receive evil things, from, good things from God, we receive evil from God. What a confused fellow. I receive good things from God. If you give me a Rolex wristwatch, I'll take it. I'm speaking tongues. If I come to preach for you and you give me 10 million naira, I'll ask you, do you want another session? <laughs> but I will write you and tell you, if you can't put this in my account, I can't preach. The moment I do that, I'm a hawk star. I'm a hawk star. Don't make a demand. Jesus said, preach, heal the sick. Freely have you received, freely should you give. But if you go somewhere and then they show you dishonor, they can't even welcome to their homes, let your blessings return to you. That is, where there's dishonor, step back. But you see, he didn't say, before you go, ask them, are you going to dishonor me? <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> no, 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 no. Don't write a letter to people, if you want to invite me, you must be able to do this, you must be able to do that, and all that. Because the grace upon my life is not common. A guy wrote me a letter, he said, you come preach for me, by text message, he chatted with me, he said, you come preach for me, we know people want to hear you, sir, and all that, but we also have a problem. We want to raise social and so amount of money, and we're sure that when you come, people will give. And but sir, we promise you that we will give you one third of the money. I said, look at the number you just called. Don't call it again. Don't call this number again. I said, look at me very well. I need money. If they sell you, it's not up to the money I need. But that is not my ministry. My desires for things doesn't come to my preaching for Christ. 
I said, never again should you invite me. He said, sir, no, we are sorry. I said, no! When you see this number, if I call you, it's a mistake. Because I treasure an incorruptible reward. And I think you should. And so Paul is saying the minister should be rewarded. Yet the very next chapter, chapter 6 verse 10, he's, he's telling Timothy, you know, Timothy ensured that preachers are rewarded. Then he's talking to Timothy. Hey, Timothy. Yes, pastor. Verse 10, 1 Timothy 6. The love of money is a root of all evil. He's not writing this to Christian businessmen. He's writing this to a preacher of grace. The love of money is a root of all evil, which some, or which while some coveted after, after coming for school of ministry, been here every year, they coveted after. They have heard from the faith and passed themselves through with many sorrows. This is not for a businessman. This is for a preacher. The some here are not unbelievers. That those who will preach the new covenant, they will preach what doctor preached this morning, a beautiful sermon on the new covenant. They know it. They know about the unmerited favor of God in Christ. But they still have that desire to own things so strong that they now corrupt the gospel. So because their ambition and achievement crazy, they will use any means to achieve it. Every one of us have achievements. Christianity did not give me any ambition. I had ambitions before I even knew who Jesus was. You see, I got to church and I just knew I could become something. Where was your brain before? It's not church that gave you ambition. From primary one, you wanted to be first in the class. That's, you don't need a sermon to want to be rich. Is in human nature. Christ comes to control our desires. That's the difference. So if you go to church and what they do is hoop that human desire, you are not in the church of Christ. You don't leave a sermon, the next thing that comes to your heart, I want to be big. What did you hear? What did you hear? You can't hear a sermon. You can't read Jesus and his words and the epistles and the next thing you want to become is the president of your nation. You didn't read them. They are not telling you not to become president of your nation. No, but that's not their ministry. You went quiet. It's good. So he says, don't love it. Don't go after it with all your power. That is, as a minister of the gospel, we are Paul. The truth of the word. And don't forget, just like Jesus, Paul says, if you have food and raiment, be what? He's not saying, don't want more. But if you have this, be happy. But you know today, if you go to a church, they'll tell you, you are more than this. And you have food and raiment already. So you are more than this. You be angry. You know, one time, I told people in our church, I preached this before, that God told me to go to an, a five-star hotel, just years ago, I won't tell you what year, to sit down and see how wealthy people act. That can you see, you can do it soon. That couldn't have been God. And as I said that, some folks in the congregation said, oh, yes, pastor, ah, oh, ah. Oh. I, I even twisted a scripture. God said to Abraham, come out, see, what can you see? I said, what can you see? Ah, see, twisting of scripture international. <laughs> what can you see? Did Abraham see any other thing but salvation through faith among the nations? So the moment your desires come into this message, you corrupt the container and eventually the content. The gospel identifies the rich and the poor and it doesn't, re it doesn't condemn anyone. If you are rich, fine. If you're poor, great. That's it. That, that's what the gospel does. 
The gospel brings both the poor and rich into a relationship with God. So make sure that the container is not self-serving. 2 Corinthians 4, 5. We preach not ourselves. We preach Christ. Say, I preach not myself. Oh, say like me. I preach not myself, but Jesus Christ. Watch your sermons. If they have so much testimonies about yourself, you're preaching yourself. Preach Christ. Stick with what he did. Now watch this. I gave this definition quickly. The gospel focuses on eternal verities. Eternal things. As humans, we pursue earthly things. Legitimately. But the focus of the gospel is on eternal things. So when we hear the gospel and grow in it, even in our pursuit, we handle earthly things lightly. It reduces what the gospel does to you, billionaire, even though you're a billionaire, you can have more. He makes you value the billions differently. Differently. You have the money, but the money doesn't have you. That's what the gospel does. We'll see, the, we'll see how that comes out. And Paul, Paul gives us a clear definition of that. Philippians 4. Verse 11. Now start from 10. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at the last your care of me had flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. Verse 11. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatever state I am. Now, obviously, he's in prison, okay? There we to be content. Do, do your church members, do they express contentment? Are they happy when there's nothing? Or your sermons make them feel bad that there's nothing. You know, you can make people feel so horrible they don't have that you make them steal. Because your sermons focus on earthly pursuits. See, I don't need a church to pursue earthly things. Enough movies, enough motivational speaking will beat any church in making me pursue earthly things. I don't need a church. I don't. I don't need a church. My father gave me uh, 10 commandments of success when I got into secondary school. If I preached that on the pulpit today, you would say, preach it! But it was written by an atheist. But all I need to do with those principles is to just look for scripture to back it up. That's all. Require to acquire, refire. Ridiculous. Anointing without finance is annoyance. What crap? There were people who were anointed that had no finance. Christ was one of them. Yeah, he was. Paul was one of them. Peter was one of them. And they were not annoyed. To the point that we teach people romance without finance will make you a nuisance. And today, you find Christian ladies are copying the world, being surprised at a cinema. Somebody brings out a ring. Oh, and all the friends are there. I was taught as a young Christian to say, oh, sister, well, I, I believe I won't marry you. Then the sister would say, let me pray about it. But the moment the guy brings out a ring in silver by cinema, how will you pray? Will you cry? <laughs> Have you lost your mind? Love not the world. Not the things that are in the world. You have to pray about it. Why did you throw a prayer? They'll say, say yes, say yes. Everybody say, come on, baby. Say yes, say yes, yes, yes. Yes. I think I hit the right chord there, right? <laughs> Come on. <laughs> Paul says, Philippians 4, I am content. When last were you content? You wanted to go to America and you couldn't. You, you don't go, mm -hmm. then you don't have the money, then you come to church. You won't tell people that it's America you want to go. 
the Lord is saying to me, there are 10 men here. You are about to step into your Canaan. But every time you want to step into your Canaan, there is a bull of Bashan. You have what is called, the Spirit of God is telling me right now, you have what is called the near miracle syndrome. I come as a servant of God. I will break every near miracle syndrome. Oxta, Oxta. Come plainly. It's not wrong for you to tell your church members, hey guys, I want to go on vacation. You are their pastor. They should take care of you. If they can afford it. But if your church, most of them are civil servants and they're from states in some states in Nigeria where it was the day of Pentecost they paid their salaries last. And it simply means, Pastor, you cannot go to America through these guys. That's all. I'm not making sense here. Come on. You can say, hey guys, I want to travel. They say, Oh, thank you, Pastor. Then they put that money. Galatians 6 says, let him that is taught in word communicate to him that teacheth in all good things. Good things depend on people. Some guys can, can buy a uh, Tokumba car for you and they call it good things. Some of us say, no, 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 no. It has to be terrible, 2018 model. It depends on what we call good. But don't bring a standard you saw in New York to Abakaliki. No. Don't bring that. That's unfair. I'm not making any sense here. Don't be a hawk star. Don't bring your desires to the pulpit. You see, as I was coming here, the Lord is telling me there are some people struggling. They're struggling. But he says, your struggle is over. You are the one that is struggling. You know how we do. Every January, we give hopeful prophecies. Middle of the year, we now say, stay. God is saying the second half of the year. He can still do something. By September, October, you start teaching Thanksgiving. You still have hope. You have life. Even if you don't have those things, you have life. By December, Thanksgiving. Then January again, you start the cycle all over again. When will that stop? What you preach in January should be the same in February. When they have millions, when they don't have, stop giving prophecies like you are a merchandiser. You are not different from a stargazer. Are you there? Still there? So Paul says, look, he says, whatever state I am content, I know both how to be abased. Do you know how to be abased and abound? How to be abased, how to abound. Where everywhere and all things I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry. Both to abound and suffer need. Wow. I can do these two things through Christ that have strengthened me. Yet, eventually commended them for giving to him. He's grateful for supply. But Paul says, no matter the circumstance, I'm in control. I don't stop coming for prayer meetings. Because I lost my job. You won't even know I lost my job. Because Christ has taken me above worldly pursuits. So you will know when I have a job and when I don't have one. Because I pray the same way. I do evangelism the same way. I give the same way. I walk in love the same way. That is the proof of salvation. Anybody can be excited when his account is full. It takes a man who knows Christ to be the same in every circumstance. He's the same. He's the same in every circumstance. Praise God. Brother, why were you not in church? You don't know what I'm going through. What are you going through? You do die in hell. So we must emphasize that the faith controls our desires. Watch this. Paul is grateful. He's grateful. Yet he says, I control these things. If you didn't give to me, I won't have lost my cool. I won't start cursing. See you! I just came back from a friend's church. Some of us do that. We go to another person's ministry and we're impressionable. We see how the choir is, how everybody is. We see the building. We say, this must happen. This can happen anywhere. 
And then you come. The Lord is showing me that we are going to another level. Or God is ambition. That's all. Anybody can see something and want to reproduce it. It's not the spirit of God. And if you look at the success stories of some godless men and the success stories of some ministries, the difference is that this one had scripture. This one did not have. That's all. Except the Lord built the house, the labor in vain that built it. You can build it, but the Lord didn't build it. It's in vain. Pure and simple. Jesus said, this house shall be a house of prayer. Not a house of merchandise. Can you pray without a prayer point? Jesus, did you ever know Jesus' prayer point? Because we have so much situated the teaching of prayer to things that we have lost the value of prayer itself. Prayer is not primarily asking. Prayer is fellowship. What was Jesus praying for in Luke 3.21 when he was being baptized? Praying for the water to be clean? To what? He just was given to prayer. Luke 5.16, he left the miracles, he went to pray. Luke 6.12, he, he went to the wilderness to pray. When he was going to die, the very night, he was praying. How come the prayer didn't change the circumstance? Prayer is not about the circumstance. Prayer is about you. Prayer changes you first before it changes things. That's why the apostle will say praying always. Many of us won't pray again when material resources are with us. We pray so much when we lose our jobs, looking for a husband, looking for wife, children, Nothing different from an idol worshiper. But prayer is not taught in scripture like that. You pray for things, no doubt. But prayer in itself is the reason why you pray. Prayer in itself is why you pray. I'm your friend. If I'm your friend, we unconsciously chat without me making a request. We just bond. We bond. Prayer is a bonding exercise. Is not a transaction exercise. That's why Jesus prayed always. He prayed always. He prayed always. But now we have created a prayer point only prayer ministry. So that many of the things we pray for in Nigerian churches can be solved by a good government. So if you have all the money, you have all the things you want. Would you still have a prayer point? You are not sick. You have money. You have everything coming. Would you still have a prayer point? If you wouldn't, then have you really been praying? So you watch that. That goes into almost everything. We don't even praise God for God. We praise him. When the praises go up, the blessings come down. What kind of crap is that? You praise him for the blessings to come. Say praise him. Rejoice, rejoice. When you rejoice very well, then God will see you and say, yes, that is it. Take. A hawk star in praise worship. Look at your prayer. Look at most of the prayers in the epistles. You almost will find none praying about something or praying about material things. You, you, have, to, you have to almost scan through. Go to Romans. Go to 1 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians. Pray for us, 1 Thessalonians 5.25. Pray without ceasing, 1 Thessalonians 5.17. Romans 12.12, 12, continue in certain prayer. Almost devoid of material things. 1 John 5, 14. That's probably the only one you can say, well, well, well. Philippians 4, 6. Be careful for nothing was about persecution. You read it. Rejoice. 
Again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known unto all men in the midst of persecution for the Philippian church. He said, that's why the response of the prayer is that the peace of God will guard your heart. I won't need a car and then what I get is peace of God. The peace of God was for troubled times and persecutions and trials. That was the reason for Philippians 4, 6. How men will steady their lives and their hearts in the will of God in spite of contrary circumstances. So prayer is for bonding. So as a preacher of the gospel, would you keep praying if you have everything in your hands? Jesus said, what will profit a man to gain this old world and lose his own soul? So it's very possible. Strength during difficulties. Boldness to champion the cause of the gospel. That was why they were praying. Check it. Strength. Pray for us. That the word of God may have a free cost. Second Thessalonians 3.1 That we might be delivered from unreasonable and wicked men for all men have not faith. Focus prayer. Watch Paul. You, you watch why they prayed. Why did Jesus pray? Was Jesus looking for a wife? Talk to me. Did he pray to get material needs met? Jesus prayed for fellowship. And glory to God. When Paul talked about praying in tongues, he didn't put a single prayer point there. It's just fellowship. If you're my friend, we just talk. But every time I call you, uh, Reverend, uh, Thank you for, I thank God for your life. You're the greatest of the greatest. I ask you in faith and I stand upon your word. Then I'll get your raised voice. Thank you ahead of time. It is mine. Amen. <laughs> How is that a song? But you know we're talking. And I get to hear you. I get to know how you think. What you say. I leave the prayer room and I reflect your character. That's what prayer primarily does to us. Following me? That's why Paul can say, I pray always. Pray always. I'm not, I don't have to have a, a problem in mind when I'm praying. I'm just in communication with the Father. When I'm done praying, I walk in his will. Because there have been bonding going on in prayer. Are you following me? Okay, good. So I'll start the round off now. So as Paul... He's talking about giving and see what he says. Uh, in Acts 20, in verse 35, remember, we're talking about the container. The container must divorce his desires from the gospel. I have showed you all things. How so believing God, no, so laboring, you ought to support the weak. Look at verse 34. Let's take verse 34 together. Yea. You yourselves know that there is a special anointing on my life. No, that these hands have ministered to my necessities and to them that were with me. Nobody among the apostles wrote supply of material things from a supernatural point of view. Not one single person. They taught supply and having from human endeavor. You see, the moment we keep relating, pay attention here so you don't lose what I'm about to say. The moment we keep relating faith in the gospel to supply of material things, we'll keep corrupting the gospel. I know it's difficult for many people that say, this message, this message. When we get to this point, all hell break loose. Yes, Paul, he says, these hands that means you know what I do for a living. He didn't say I got it by speaking in tongues. They have ministered to my needs and to them that were with me. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, he was consistent. No, first of all, Ephesians 4.28. He says, let him that stole steal no more. And that's not you. This is not for you. Don't read this for prosperity. Are you, are you a thief? Let him that stole steal no more. Let, let him walk, labor, walking with his hands. The thing that is good, honest, that he may have to give to him that is in need. Consistent. For Thessalonians. 
1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Look at Paul. He says in verse 6, Nor of men sought we glory, neither of you, he says, nor yet of others, that we might be, we have been bothersome as the apostles of Christ, were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherishes our children. So being affectionately desires of you, we're willing to have imparted unto you, and not only the gospel of God, but also our souls. Not just the content, but also what? The container. Because you were there unto us. Can we take verse 9 together? You remember, brethren, our labor and travail. For laboring night and day, because we will not be chargeable to any of you, we preach the gospel of God unto you. He's consistent about this. Second Thessalonians chapter 3. Very consistent. He says, look. In verse 7. You yourselves know how you ought to follow us, for we behave not ourselves disorderly among you. Neither did we eat any man's bread for nothing, but we wrought with labor and travel night and day that we might not be chargeable to any of you. How many witnesses do we have now? I can go on and on. They did not relate financial prosperity to anything supernatural. They just said, we worked. We labored night and day. Someone say, how then do Christian businessmen succeed? The way you learn to drive. The way you learn to read and write. The way you learn to use devices. The way you learn everything. That's it. The church should stop thinking you address every need. Let schools do their job. Let business, business schools do their jobs. Let the church teach Christ. Focus on your own curriculum. They don't use your curriculum. Don't use theirs. Stick to your work. Stick to what you ought to teach. Let people go. Let them, let them get degrees. Let them get knowledge elsewhere. Let them know how to make money. Good. But when they come to church, we teach them how money must not make them. You learn how to have money outside. We teach you here how money ought not to have you. Shouldn't have you. You don't come to service late because you are now a billionaire. You come so late. When you were, you used to come to church very early. Now you come late and your shoes now become the sound of many waters. Cool. 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 Ah, she's around. And then your perfume. You know what I said the other time? Fills the temple. No, no, no. Don't let that have you. You are now a billionaire, but you are still an usher. And that's a Christian. You have millions of dollars in your account. It doesn't show because you are the car park, packing cars. Doctor, say, Dr. Damina says, hey, brother, I didn't see you in church on Sunday. You don't say, uh, you do now. People over, say, I'm sorry, sir. I, I had to be somewhere. Uh, but, but I will make sure I attend fellowship on Tuesday. He has money, but he doesn't have him. He has learned the word. Not to allow earthly things become his status. His status remains the same in Christ, money or no money. That's what the gospel does. You following my point? So let's wrap up on this. Said with my hands. So watch this. Money is central to man's desires, but it's not central to us. Christ is central to us. We allow him to live through us and we preach him. And there must not be conflict of interest. As I close, remember, you can preach the gospel with strife. Philippians 1, Paul says some preach the gospel with strife. You can. You can have the wrong motive. Philippians 1, verse 15 and 16. Some do it. Some preach the gospel as Hoxter, 2 Corinthians 2, 17. We read that earlier. Some will err from the faith. Because you want to have a massive project in your city. And you have told people that God told you to do it. You now begin to create new doctrines. Grace for common speed. Grace for unsearchable riches. And those riches are searchable in bank accounts. You are now like Balaam. 
that Peter spoke about, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. Who did what he did for the wages of unrighteousness? Because when that is your dictate, you begin to hear your appetite and not the Spirit of God. In Philippians chapter 3, Philippians 3 and verse 18, Paul says, For many walkers of whom I have told you often and now tell you even weeping that they are enemies of the cross. Watch this now. Can we take verse 19 together? Whose end is destruction? Whose God is their appetite? The belly is not your stomach. It's appetites. Whose glory is in their shame? Who mind what? Earthly things. Some won't come for this kind of school of ministry because you've not found Dr. Damina boast about how much is in his account. Even though he has. Say, what is happening? This is not working. Come and look at one school of ministry I went to in Lagos. The man said, I checked our balance sheet. How many banks have our turnover? <laughs> and you sat down there throughout. You were in an AGM. Annual general meeting. You are not even a shareholder. You are just a journalist. <laughs> That's a business meeting. Imagine Paul saying, check our balance sheet. Third Corinthians 4.4. 4. We have nothing to boast of but the cross of Christ. When Bill Gates talks about what he has, how much he has, when Dan Gote talks about how many he has built, we keep quiet on those things even if we have them. Just say, thank God for the cross of Christ. I have nothing to glory of, but I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Christ lives in me. He said, but, but I thought you have a Rolls Royce. No, it doesn't have me, so I have no boast in it. If I lose the Rolls Royce, it doesn't, it doesn't change my joy. My joy is permanent and eternal. It's given to me in Christ Jesus. But that guy that is boasting, if he loses his Rolls Royce, he loses himself. They know him because of what he has. They must know me only because of Christ. That's what the gospel does to us. We have it, but it doesn't have us. And when we don't have it, nothing changes. A preacher who boasts about the assets of their ministry is shameless. He doesn't know the gospel. Nobody can preach the gospel and boast of money. It's totally against what you're preaching. James chapter 4. James chapter 4, verse 13. I'm closing gradually now. Go to now, you say. Today or tomorrow, we will go to such a city and continue there, yeah, and buy and sell and yet gain. Whereas you know not what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is even a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. True for all men. Believer, unbeliever. All right, good. For what you ought to say is this is the will of God we shall live and do this or that. Can we take verse 16 together? But now you rejoice in your boastings. All such rejoicing is evil. Evil. And therefore to you, a preacher of the finished work of Christ that knows to do good and doesn't do it, it's a sin. You know what you ought to boast about. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. The indwelling of the spirit. Fellowship with the father. The reality of our redemption in Christ. Reality of our righteousness in Christ. God is now my father. I have the name of Jesus. I have a body that will be glorified into immortality. That is our boasting. It's shameless that preacher is boasting. 
and no longer ride fairly used cars. We've gone beyond that level. I've said it before in a shameless way as a fool. How different are you from the rich fool? The rich fool said, I have nowhere to even put my money. We bought that building with one offering and one service. We didn't even touch church account. <laughs> oh, fool. That's what you are. Jesus said, and when you die, who's going to spend all that money? Somebody owned this land before we got here. He doesn't even know we're here. The person who gives to the person that gives to the person that gives to the person. That's how life is. Always transcends like a vapor. But one thing is eternal. Our fellowship with the Father. And in that, we always boast. So know what your focus is. Know what it is. Know what it is. The focus of the gospel remains what is eternal. And once and forever. The very last and last scripture. Revelation 3. Jesus warned a church. Now I warned us this night to make a commitment to preach no longer a gospel of our needs, but a gospel of the grace of God. Revelation 3, verse 16. Why did he call that church lukewarm? It's not because they were not doing prayer meetings. No. He says, and because thou art lukewarm, Revelation 3, 16, neither cold nor hot, I will spew you out of my mouth. The, the, the spew there had to do with the works. Verse 17, because thou sayest, is this not what we say all the time? I am rich. Say after me, I am rich. And increase with goods and have need of nothing. We don't need anything. Our ministry don't have needs. We meet he says, and knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. These are not the claims of the gospel. These are the claims of for falling man. Say after me, I don't have needs. Ha! Say after me, I am rude. And the guy that doesn't have transport fare. I am rich. <laughs> Being rich was not a confession. It was a fact. Charge them that are rich, not by faith. Rich. In this world. They say, I am rich. Tell me, I am rich. I am rich. You are not rich. And don't feel bad that you are not. You are rich in the goodness of God. You are rich in the grace of God. You are rich in the gifts of righteousness. And when all this world is gone, all the Rolls Royce and Ferrari have destroyed, when all the mountains are gone, when all the essays are gone, you will still be rich. Stand to your feet, lift your hands. Worship Jesus. Who's on the keyboard? Play for me. I have a song I want us to sing. Before I close, I want you to dedicate your life to never have conflict of interest. I have my needs. You have yours. But the gospel is not the means for it. So I'll keep my needs separate from my ministry. I am a servant. I am a servant. I lay aside. I, I, love, I love vacation. I love a private jet. I hope to have one. But if it doesn't come, it changes nothing. Because I am rich and I will be rich. When this life is over, I will still be rich. But those guys, in only in this life they have hope. They have all men miserable. Lift those hands and just make a commitment to Jesus. I will not just have your message. I will have your ministry. I won't be a hawkster. I know I have needs. I have things I want now. But I won't use this to corrupt it. No. 
It's a song by Darling Check. I know you know it. You are the love of my life. You are the hope that I cling. You mean more than this world to me. I won't trade you for silver or gold. I won't trade you for riches and all. You are. Sing that song. You are. Sing, Lord, you are, you are the love of my life. Jesus, you are, you are the hope that I need. More than this world, more than this world to me, I won't trade you. For silver, reaching for gold, I will trade you for riches and gold. You are. Let's take it two more times. Lift those hands. Say, you are. You are the love of. Jesus, you are, you are the hope that I need. More than this world, more than this world, all to me. And I won't trade you for sin. Yes, you are. You are. Say, I won't trade you. I won't trade you for silver or gold. For riches on top. I won't trade you for riches on Pray for your ministry now. Pray for your ministry. Pray for your ministry. Someday you will see Jesus. And he will ask you what you did with the gospel. Pray for your ministry. You have the content. But what about the container? Before I leave, there's another old song. Amen. And I know many of you know that song. It's an old song. I hope you know it. Lord, you are more precious than silver. Lord, you are more costly than gold. Lord, you are more beautiful than them. There is nothing I desire compared. Sing it two more times, come on. Lord, you are, Lord, you are my precious than silver. Son, come on. Oh. 